Hello and welcome to another month of Azure Databricks brought to you by Advancing Analytics. Today's topic is how do you size your Databricks clusters? And it's a very awkward one because there's so many different options. The reason for that is because it's based on the Azure VM sizes and there's lots of different variants depending on whether you prefer more memory to CPU, more CPUs, whether it's a general balance. It's quite a tricky minefield. Now the biggest bit of advice is that when you're looking at those sizes, that's not the total amount of memory that you get. There is an overhead. So because they've got the OS, because you've got the Databricks shell, then if you look at that server at the top and it says 14 gig of memory, that's not everything you're going to get. You're only going to get a slice of that for storing data, for having a data cache, for doing transformations. So be very careful about picking that top size. Okay, so I've got a quick example to try and explain how this is working. Bit of blob storage here. I've got six big chunky files. There's about three gig of data in total. And we're going to access this via our cluster and pull it into a notebook. I'm going to have a look at what happens. So here's my cluster. Really simple. I've got just two nodes, 14 gigs, size ones, the really most basic executors you can possibly have. Now let's have a look at what happens when we pull some data on there and how it's going to utilize those two worker servers. So I've got a really quick notebook here, a bit of connection stuff that we'll go through in another topic. And then if we scroll down, we'll see I'm creating a data frame. So I'm accessing my data. You can see I'm going to that taxi full directory I had to try and suck up all of that data, treating it as a single data set. I'm going to do a cache. So I'm going to tell you, actually, I want you to persist this in memory. I want you to bring it into memory, spread it across my workers, and then keep it there for future use. I've done a quick count just to force it to execute and bring that stuff in. And also to show you that there's 88 million rows there. There's actually quite a lot of data that I've brought in. Okay, so I've ran my query. Let's go see what's happened. So I can go into my cluster, go to the Spark UI to see what's going on. And then I've got a few tabs underneath there. So interesting one is storage. I can go and have a look at what are my RDDs. Remember, they're the resilient distributed data sets. That's what, how it stores the data when it's actually held in memory. And I've got 25 cache partitions, and I've brought all that data in, so I've got 100% of the data in memory. So obviously, I didn't have 25 files, so it's managed to chunk up those files as Reddit to increase the parallelism. And it's compressed it quite a lot. So instead of that 3 gig, I've got about 1.4 gig of memory. So that's obviously great. really, really helps me. But how did it do that across the executors then? I've got 25 blocks. So on my executors tab, I can see my two different executors. And it split it not too bad. It's not an even number, so it couldn't put an even number of blocks on each. Got 12 on one, 13 on another. And you can see it's using up a fair amount of that, of that 3.9 gig space I've got for caching data on there. And that's not a lot. That's nothing compared to my 14 gig I've actually got on that VM. So that gives you an idea of that overhead, the price you're paying. So let's have a look at that in uh, in theory. If I've got my data spread out in a lake and I write my data frame query, when I execute it, it's going to pull that data up onto that cluster. And again, hopefully nice and easily, hopefully kind of a good spread of things across my different workers. And obviously, part of that depends on how many different files you've got in your partition. If I've got 20 odd files, that's going to increase the number of partitions I'm going to have. One thing to be aware of is this repartition function. So I can run a query telling it, actually, I don't want 25. I want you to actually do five partitions. And that's going to change how it stores that. And obviously, be very careful, because in my case, if I repartition to one partition, then that's going to be a lot on one server. That's going to actually try and get most of my available memory. Now, there's some other commands, such as collect, which would sort of force data up onto the driver. So be really, really careful with things like collect, because if that the total data set is bigger than the amount of memory you've allocated for your driver, you're going to get an out-of-memory exception. There's similar things that can happen on the workers. So if I'm running certain queries that's going to force it to group data together, then I can have a same kind of problem. So this group by key is going to rearrange it. It's going to repartition my data, and each individual key is going to be a single partition. Now, a partition cannot be spread across more than one worker. Meaning I need to be really, really careful to make sure I don't pick something that's going to massively skew my data and end up with more data in a single partition that can fit on one of my workers. So these are the kind of concerns that you have to have. What's the total amount of memory I'm trying to reserve for data? And what kind of actions am I doing that might end up with some kind of skew or a force of data up onto the head? So what are the considerations that we have when we're dealing with this 
kind of stuff. For the driver, what's the biggest data set we're going to return to the end user via something like a Jupyter Notebook? Even returning data sets, that has to go through the driver. Am I doing anything that's not going to be natively parallelized and that might run on the driver itself? And I've got to worry about concurrency. So if I'm doing lots and lots and lots of things all at once, then the driver is going to have to deal with that and deal with concurrency and deal with orchestrating all of my workers. So the size of driver is impacted and it has an impact on the amount of concurrency that you have. Then got the size of worker. So obviously sizing your individual workers increases the amount that a single worker can do. It means you can fit a larger data set or partition onto that single executor if you're doing things like heavy groups and sorts within partitions and that kind of thing. If the CPU intensive stuff, if it's got lots of things available there, then that's nice. Concurrency obviously has an impact on because of the number of compute cores you have on each of those workers. One of the biggest ones is cost. So if I'm trying to get more CPU by getting a bigger and bigger and bigger worker, that's more expensive by having than having the same number of CPU across lots of small workers. So there's an exponential rise in the size of VM as you try and get these bigger and bigger and bigger VMs. On the flip side, we've got the sheer number of workers. So how many different boxes that you need, and then depending on the size of worker that you've chosen, that has some of the things that we have to consider. So what's the total amount of data I've got? So if I've chosen a worker that's going to give me about 4 gig per worker of available caching space, then if I've got 40 gigs worth of data, I'm going to need 10 of those boxes. So you can do a little bit of math to work out how many workers you need based on how big you think that single worker can be. Obviously, it also has an impact on concurrency. The more workers that you have, the more cores and therefore slots you've got available, the more jobs and tasks you can run at once. So based on those different considerations, we've got a few different example workers we can talk about. So my standard ETL load, I'm doing little bits of file preparation, a bit of cleaning, a bit of dimension preparation. I can have a fairly small cluster and just leave it turned on, sharing lots of work across it. Auto scaling will help. For my larger data sets, if I've got a big chunky fact I need to work through, a lot of the time that's quite good to parallelize. So I can just have lots and lots of small worker loads. I'm not doing anything particularly special or intensive in that querying. I'm just doing dimensional joins and that kind of stuff. And that'll parallelize that quite nicely. So a small number of, a lot of small worker nodes. I do have some odd things that come up occasionally when someone's trying to train a very, very complicated data science model. And not all of the machine learning libraries will natively scale. Um, so some of them you need to put it on a chunky box because they're not built to take advantage of the parallelism that Spark gives you. And then finally you've got cases where I just want to leave a server turned on. I want to have lots of ad hoc queries. I've got many, many users all trying to access it at the same time, all trying to work together and then competing for that resource. So for that one, I tend to have a fewer number of worker nodes, have it auto scaling set up so when busy periods, it's just going to allocate a little bit more uh, compute, a little bit more uh, capacity for that. And one of the big things I've got is high concurrency clusters. Now, they need to be a little bit careful using high concurrency clusters because you can't use Scala. They only work with Python, SQL, and R. But what they do give you is a workload fairness uh, element. So it will automatically kill off jobs that are blocking other ones. If something's been running for too long and it goes over a certain threshold, it'll stop that job and allow other things to continue. So it's kind of allowing people to work and share uh, that capacity. So that's the kind of thing that you're working with and it's okay that things will occasionally get killed to make sure everyone else can keep working and things are passing through quickly. Then maybe that's a good idea for your analytics loads. Okay, so that has been our month of Azure Databricks on how you size your Databricks cluster. See you next time.